Welcome to the um, summer course, the course of Tammuz, for the Way of Reason, uh, Derek Tumas and the Ramchal. Basically, what we want to do in this course is like this. And, and first, let's get the ground rules of the actual what's going on here. Ground rules are you can ask as many questions as you like. I'd rather you ask questions than not, because then I can see if you're, you know, if you're getting the material. The fact that it's on film, things like that, don't worry about that. We can edit out that later. Um, the course here, before I tell you exactly what we're going to go through, um, the Ramchal wrote three books on Torah learning. The first one, not that they're necessarily in order, but the first one we're going to do is The Way of Reason, uh, Derek Tunos, which is about the Gemara itself. Um, what are we going to do in the, in the course? It's impossible for us to go through all the details. That's an, it's an eight session course, we can't do that. However, we actually, I set up a pretty um, packed in course. If you stick with me and you go with it, you'll get a big overview and a lot of things you'll be able to apply. That's one thing. Uh, it's gonna be twice a week. Also, what I'm willing to do, if people are interested, uh, and you tell them you're going to be, and you'll come, is on Friday mornings, if that's possible, between whatever's good for people, 10, 30, and 12, 11, and 12, I'm willing to do a review class, which we won't do any new material, but we will do exercises and uh, go over things, and we can talk it out and have more of a, a, a talking session about the ideas that are spoken about and the specific skills. Because one of the things I want to do, even the, it's a little bit of a dichotomy because we're going to do the principles, is to is you come away with skills. Not just talk about the philosophy of, of how the Gemara works, but also get down to specific protein. Okay? Good. Oh, oh yes, you, that you can take. Good. Let's look at this. Uh, this... This we're just beginning out, so um, hopefully one day this will, this will be the beginning of a, of a workbook, or at least a formalized uh, uh, a work release for the course. So let me go through what we're planning on doing before we start. Okay, the first, so these are gonna be, they're gonna be eight classes. The first one's gonna be this one, the Gemara's a focused dialogue, which is really introduction, a very important introduction into which the Ramchal starts the book with, in chapter one, you can write on these. These are for you. So there are certain things I didn't, you know, they didn't get in, write it down. So the first one, as you're going to see, will be involved with chapter one. The Gemara is a focused dialogue, and that's the general introduction. Very important. We'll do that in a minute. Then, also hopefully today, if we push well, will be the understanding statements of Chazal, which is chapter three. That's just for your general reference. By the way, when I'm talking about the book, I, re I highly recommend for anybody who can can to buy this green book. This is, the green, this is the book that was actually published specifically for this kind of purpose. A course, it's fairly cheap, but they think it runs about 38 shekels. Uh, it has all three books of the Ramchals on Torah learning in it. It's uh, easy to carry, and it's the book that I'm going to use here. However, if people want the English, there is the way of reason, the old uh, book from Feldheim, though I did mention that a new book is coming out very, very soon. Um, all three books that are in the Derech HaKodesh. The Derech HaKodesh, you'll see in a minute, uh, is the general term for all the three books of the Ramchal on Torah learning. It's actually taken a phrase taken from the Ramchal's introduction from Derech Tfunos. Um, so if you want the English for this course, you can get this now. If, if you can wait a little bit, the updated version is going to come out soon. I'm tr I try to make it that even if a person didn't have any books, any of the Ram Khal's books, though I recommend you get them. If you didn't have them, you could go through the course. What we need, I pretty much try to put in the booklet form, in, in, in the paper form, and I do my own translations or whatever you'll see. So if you can't, then if you just stick with it, you'll get it. Okay. Just to give you an overview of what we want to cover in the course. So again, the understanding the statements of the Ram Khal, breaking down statements, that will be true both in the Gemara and in general. 
That hopefully will be today. Number two, positioning of statements. The relationship of two statements in a Gemara or any time in a dialogue, which means you can have opposites, alternatives. It's a very important tool to know when you want to get in the Shakla Vataria of the Gemara. This statement was just made. What was its exact relationship to the statement that went in front of it? That should be on Sunday. And inferences, diukim. Diukim are parts of the message that are not explicit. Very, very important. Diukim, that's Sunday. Then the next two classes are going to be syllogism, hekeshim. Hekeshim, by the way, positioning of uh, statements is chapter 4, inferences is chapter 5. These two hekeshim are both cha- of syllogisms, both chapter 7. Syllogisms, if I had one thing to teach you, I mean, I, it's kind of a crazy statement to make, but if I, had one, if I had you for an hour and I really wanted to up your skills in Gemara or thinking in general, I would say let's work on Hekeshim, which is, the, which is needed for the proofs and the thinking and the process, not only in everyday life and in the Gemaras. And ultimately that's, even when they talk about logic or thinking, they're talking about how did you know that? Where did you get that? What's the logic behind that? Explain that to me. Very, very important. And then you have rayas, which are proofs for, steers, which are proofs against. Uh, proofs for and proofs against are both chapter 8. And I'll explain to you in a minute why that is also fundamental. The structure of the dialogue, which will be the seventh class, which is actually implementing what we have in the Shakla What? Uh, that's chapter 9. And the method, the order of questions, to ask yourself how to take basically everything we learned and how to apply it, that is in chapter 10. That's the last one, the method, the order to ask yourself. Um, if you get the books, please, the more you read, you'll, uh, the better you'll do. Um, I was thinking about this today, that in terms of also speaking about the general idea of the course. There are certain things, Gemara is involved in complexities. Complexity means things get, they get not clear. They, why are they not clear? Because they're they complex. They kind of get obtuse, complex. Lots of times the mind needs to be prepared. A person needs to, their mind to be prepared to be able to handle those things, whether it's in the Shakla, Tosfos, whatever it is. This preparation that's needed for you to understand what's going on. That's what this course is going to give you, Bezrat Hashem. To be able to prepare you to know the methods, to know the models that you're going to see. So when you get the overviews, you'll say, ah, that, I used to have a problem with the Kalva Homer. Kalva Homer always, you know, like turned me around a little bit. Now I can tell you exactly how a Kalva Homer works, which is one of our syllogisms. And I can tell you exactly how to mafare every Kalva Homer. Every Kalva Homer has the same theory, and there's only three ways to mafarek it, and the Gemara will always do one of those three. If you know that, and many, many other methods, so when you see it, you say, okay, I now just have to fit that specific case into the general rules. That's basically what we're going to do. Any questions about anything? Good question. Here comes the good answer. <laughs> the answer is like this. The Ramchal doesn't explain to you a shita. We in the modern yeshiva world will call this a shita. It has, it's not a shita in the sense that you have brisk, you have the tells, you have whatever you have. It's not a shita. He's explaining to you what is common. That means all of us, whether it's Rabbi Chaim Halevi or whether it's uh, somebody else, how our minds work, and the processes that our minds go through. It happens to be, even though we all, mitzad hashave, our minds work the same way, and that's what Matan Hashem gave us, our minds work basically similarly. However, we have Bechira, so you have a million possibilities. But the process, the order, will be the same, and that's what he's explaining to you. You get to decide which one you want to choose, but your way that you're going to make that decision, I can track that for you. 
The Ramchal will help you track how you made that decision. But the decision is a free choice. You'll do what you want to do. So it's not a shita. A shita is already, which one did you choose? Rabbeinu Chaim, instead of going on the classic form of cause and effect, will go on what's known as nos and mishaber. Associated concepts. If you have this, this comes along with it. That's not because it's the cause of it. It's not the effect of it. It comes along with it. That's the din. That is brisk in a nutshell. I mean... But that's just a matter of choices when you choose. We're talking about the Ramchal's thing. Okay. When we get to Gemara, one of the biggest things when we're, this is, okay, that was the pre-introduction. Now the introduction of what a Gemara is. If you turn to your first page. This is the first. This, by the way, you can see in the bottom is on page 30 in the green book, which is always our reference. This is the opening chapter, the opening paragraph from the first chapter of the Ramchal. We, the Ramchal explains to us what a Gemara is. If I asked you, in a nutshell, explain to me, what is a Gemara? Like, what is it? I'm not not any, spe, any specific Gemara. Gemara, all Gemaras. Any Gemara. What? It's Peirut Hashem Mishnah. Very good. That is its, that is its goal. Lefar Hashem Mishnah. It's Tachlis. How does it go about it? Let me, so I'll get my question more specific. How does it go about it? How does it do that? So the Rampal starts. So we're going to read this together. I didn't really like write a lot of notes on it. I'm going to talk to you about it. Hamasa matani yuni. This phrase, three words. Hamasa matani yuni. Technically, you can call it the investigative discussion. I call it the focus dialogue. Dialogue means back and forth between two people. You can call it, let's call it like that. A focus dialogue or discussion between two people. That is what a Gemara is, and that's the general subject of this whole course. Gemara is a general term that we use. This is the process that the Gemara goes about in getting towards its goal, which will be in Lafaris, the Mishnah. Like, what is it? What's the process? Give me a name for the process that it's doing. That's called Hamasa Matanit Yuni. It's back and forth, the Makshan, the Bal Hamemra. He said something, I have a kasha, he's metaritz me, he brings a raya, I bring a raya. That bouncing ball, back and forth, that masa and matan, and it's investigative. We have, we have a goal. We have a goal. We're not, st- we're not talking about stam, uh, I don't know, we want to talk about baseball or something. Not just, we have a goal. And what is that? So, hamasa matan ayuni hu ha'esek v'achakira b'mamar min ha'mamarim odei min adeos. What does it deal with? It's an occupation. It's something we occupy ourselves with. And this is what the Gemara does. And it's investigative. It's a chakira. In statements, statements that are made usually by Amorayim, or Adeyas, their ideas, to clarify and to reveal if that statement or that Deya is true or not. That's the process. Amlam Hambera ze Yasabe Ara Hatainos. So, how do you do it? How do you clarify if something's true or false? You say something, I disagree. You say that, I disagree. Okay, we happen to be a Bayan Arava, so it's formalized and it's worked out. Rav Ashi, who, by the way, is the author of the Gemara? Who's the, so, I, I made a phone call a couple of, about two weeks ago to one of my former Rebbe's, Rav Yeshua Cohen, who's known in the world as Shas Cohen. And I said to him, I had a question like this. I said to him, Rav Yeshua, when Ravina and Ravashi wrote the Gemaras, did they try, and you, and you have, let's say, in the Gemara now, a statement with a certain rabbi's name on it. Did they try to keep his form of talking? Like, everybody speaks a little bit differently. Every people, people express themselves differently. Some people speak rhetorically, some people speak in questions, some people speak long, short. I said, did they, did the Rina of Ashi, did they try to, like, keep that? When it's, let's say, has Rav Papa's statement, Rabbi Yochanan. So he said, stop. I said, yeah. 
He said, I want you to hear this well. He said it to me three times. He said, only Rav Ashi is the author of the Gemara. So that was my first mistake. He said, only he wrote the Gemara. Ravina was his chavir, and they worked through it. Only Rav Ashi wrote the Gemara. And the answer was, he said to me, yes. He brought me rice from two Tosfoses, one in Kedusha, and I don't remember where. But anyway, that's just a, a, a side point. But here, how do they clarify things are true or false? This clarification will be done by setting up the tainas. Tainas means rayas and steeras. That there are to claim to establish and to teach the truth or to knock out that given statement. Both in Shabachin Koch, Tainas Amantos, in a way that the Gemara will assess the varying strengths of those rayas, the ones that for and the ones that against, the yukra, in the end it will make a decision. That which is more pleasing to the mind. This is a fundamental paragraph. We learn in here a very interesting thing. The Gemaras, we have, as we, as, as, I don't know your name, David, as Reb David told us, to clarify the Gemaras, to clarify the Mishnahs. We have Mishnahs which are known information. And this is a major part of what a Gemara does. Important to be understood. We'll talk about it a lot when we talk about Rayas, which are those Tainas, those claims, for and against statements. There's known information. There's different types of known information. There is axiomatic information, sensory perception information. I saw that. How do you know? I saw it. I saw him go to the store. How do you know that's true? Well, the axioms, that's a general principle. There are things that are agreed to by everybody, what's called common sense or conventional wisdom. You don't go outside in the snow without a coat on or without boots or without shoes. You call that common sense. It's agreed upon. Maybe if you were, we were in Eskimos, we would do it. There's also the Torah. We agree upon the Torah to accept it as a raya or as a stira. And then there's logical, there's logical rayas. That's known as known information. We have the known information of the Mishnah. The Gemara will then come and we'll have a case that's a gray case. Is it an extension of that case in the Mishnah or not? I don't know. It's not exactly the case of the Mishnah. So the game of the Gemara, if, if you will, will be this unknown case, this case in the gray area. Can I show that it's under the umbrella of the case of the Mishnah or not? The one who brings a raya says, yes, it is. I'll show you how it is. Well, it's not exactly, because if it was exactly, so then it wouldn't be a great case. A great case, it's a little bit off. The, the case is a little bit different. We have to bring a raya. We have to extend, show you that there's a bridge from there to here. The one who's the soter will say, no, that's not true. You, it's not under the umbrella of the Mishnah or that price or anything. It's not. So it's going to be two big elements which the Ramchal goes through and we're going to talk about. One is, what, what is known information? That, these days we talk about information being in the cloud. What is the cloud of known information, known principles, that I can prove this statement to be true because I can link it, bridge it with that? So there's two parts. Where's the information come from? And the, blink, and the bridging material. The bridging material are the syllogisms, or the hecation, or the logical extensions. But that is basically when the Ramchal talks about Habeira ze yase, line three, second word. Habeira ze yase ba'erach hatainu sheish liton l'kaimu amto. This clarification of what's a specific statement, a specific day is true, will be done when we arraign the claims, the proofs and disproofs, that there are to claim either on the side to establish this, accept it, or to deny it. And, and that's what we do. So that's basically the beginning and the understanding of a Gemara. A Gemara really, as one of my chaverim told me this week, one of the ways to translate, or even in a more exact way to translate the phrase, Hamasa Matana Yuni, the first phrase is a speculative dialogue. Dialogue, again, being the process, we're talking back and forth. That we're going to talk a lot about because to even understand the Gemara, you must understand it in the context of being a dialogue, 
a kasha and a teretz, two people speaking. Even to understand what they said, you have to understand it in that context. We're not up to there yet. But it's speculative. Speculative means we're, there's no, we're not 100% sure. A Abai will tell you he's right. Rav will tell you he's right. But you see, there's no 100 clad, 100% proof that either of them is right. They're speculating on this gray case, on this case that's on the borderline. Is it connected up to that Mishnah? An extension of it? Is it a prat in the klal? Is it a dimyon? It's dometu? Because if it's in our gray line, one of our principles is that if it's not naturally and essentially part of that case, you need a riot to hook it up. And the fight's going to be, you're going to try to bring a raya, and I'm going to try to remove your raya. But that's a very important, just to understand what a Gemara is. It's a speculation. It also happens to be Kadosh. What Rav Ashi wrote down and made it like this, and he said, it's Kadosh. So it's speculation. The Amoraim are trying to extend the Mishnahs, but it's also, it's not, they don't know for sure. That's the process. We're learning that process. Okay, this is the end of the introduction. Any questions about any part of it? What it means that it's Kadosh, I understand the way the Ramchal explains it like this. When Ravashi wrote the Gemara, when he authored the Gemara, so there was many, many possibilities. Didn't you ever wonder that you have like a, this question and you have these geniuses, these Kadosh people from all the world, and it comes down to two possibilities? Either it's either Abaya or Rava, it's only two. The way the pro, it's highly edited. Our goal in this class, which is, it's a big thing, embedded in the language of the Gemara is not only what they said, but the proofs for what they said. Most people's skills are not strong enough to understand all that embedded information, that stuff that's actually right there in the Gemara on the daf. So what do we do is I say, listen, what's the, explain to me the logic behind that kasha. That's kasha. Where does he have a right to have kasha on Rabbi Yochanan? He has a pircha on Rabbi Yochanan. Explain to me. It's right there in the daf. And the words are so compressed and compact, it's there. But most people say, well, I'll tell you what the, the Rashba holds, and I'll tell you what the Ritva holds, how he explains that kasha. Say, listen, I'm not up to that yet. I don't want to know that. I want to know from the Gemara. Explain to me. It's in there. We don't, most people don't have that skill. I'm speaking also personally. Didn't have that skill. You know, I'm learning that. The Ramchal is teaching me that skill. How to do that and how to get that out of the Gemara itself. So we don't have to already like jump to Rishonim, jump to Achronim. Maybe even including Rashi. Okay? Kadosh is the way that Ravina, uh, that Ravashi wrote it for us to get that full, that full length of the thing. Halavai. Okay, next page. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to learn how to read, break down Lashon Chazal. This is chapter three. Okay, the intro to this goes like this. You're gonna see, by the way, and I'll, I'll just show you if we turn the further pages. How to be able to break down like things in davening that we say every day. If I asked you, what is the subject of this atakadosh v'shim chakadosh? Who is it speaking about and who, or if you say who, and what is it saying about them? And it is, is it a simple statement or a complex statement? All those kind of things we're going to do right now, teaching the skills. About another 35 minutes. This is going to be a lot. Stick with me. Ask questions if you don't get it. Okay, so now turn back. Understanding the language of Chazal. Every communication, and this includes in the Gemaras, that was ever made and ever will be made between two people has to, by definition, have two parts. And this is the base unit we're going to be talking about in the class because when you're talking about communication, this is the atom. I know we go down to smaller units now, but the atom of it. It's called a sentence or a statement. And it has to have two parts. It has to have the subject and it has to have the predicate. No, those coming out of our English school past, those are not necessarily the most nice words, but that's what we got. The predicate is what's going to be affirmed and denied, and the subject, who are you going to affirm and deny that in? Look here in the first example. 
A predicate is some attribute that is affirmed or denied in the subject. Examples. Nashim chayvot b'kiddush yom. Women are obligated to hear kiddush. Again. Nashim chayvot b'kiddush yom. Women are obligated to hear kiddush. That's the translation. This is the analysis. The predicate obligated to hear kiddush, that's the predicate. That is, can be something that can be affirmed or denied, meaning that's how you tell a predicate. How are you going to pick out the predicate, which is the attribute? That is something that can be said, they are chayiv, they're not chayiv. Maybe they're not chayiv, maybe nashim are chayiv, katanim, young children are not chayiv, maybe pregnant women immediately after their birth are not chayiv. You have some people, some people are, some people are not. That's how you pick out a predicate. It's something that can be affirmed, yes, or denied, no. So here we see the predicate is the chiyuv of Kiddush Hayom. It is being affirmed in that subject known as women. There's no question about it. There's no gray area. That is it. That's what you mean. Well, this happens to be a simple case. We're going to get to ones that are going to be... I mean, in, in what sense? In the sense, is it always so clear? Yeah. This is what you mean here. In this case. The rules are clear. It's affirmed. It's affirmed. They're chayiv in Kiddush. They are, women are yes chayiv in Kiddush. Somebody told me, I, I never saw it myself, somebody told me there was a movie out, maybe some of you are familiar with it, called The Karate Kid. I know they originally made one in the 90s, I think, and then they remade one in 04, I think. This is what a person told me. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. They told me the story of The Karate Kid was like this. There was a kid who was getting beat up, so he wanted to study karate. So how did this master karate guy, what did he do? He said, he didn't start away by teaching him already the katas and how to move and stuff like that. He did very, the fundamental movements with him. He, he is, so he, uh, I don't know, it's painted or something like that. I don't know. Someone told me. They, he showed him how, to, him how to paint the side of a wall. And the kid said to him, what are you, uh, hocking me a cup? You're driving me crazy or taking his coat and putting up on a hook. And the master really had his mind in the movements. In the, he broke it down to the most fundamental units. And when he taught the kid the most fundamental units, later, when it had to be applied, he was, his basis, his yesod, was much, much stronger. That's what we're doing. That's how the Ramchal did it with us. I know many people, myself included, and many of my chaverim for many years, when we got to like this thing, break down sentence, subject, and predicates, it was kind of like, oh, please. A lot of guys just melted away. But having been through, persevered, having one of those few who persevered, I will tell you that the whole system and the whole Gemara and all communication are based on this. If you can get this, it may sound real basic, and it is. It's the, br the brass tacks. You will have a much easier time for every step, including the logic when it comes, because you'll be looking for the pieces. You're getting now the definitions of the pieces, how to break down that essential movements. So, known information. what? Known information. Many times that will be the known information, that will be your proofs, your rias, the whole schmear. You'll need a variety, it will make your understanding of rias and steers and kashas and terraces and the logic. This is the base because you can get a clear picture of actually what's being said. We are not going to do it today, but Zerat Hashem will do it Sunday. We're going to take these basic understandings in these of fairly simple senses. When you now apply it to the Gemara, where the sentences are not simple, if you don't have the strong foundation, you're going to get lost. When you come to a Gemara and you say, like, clearly, what did he say? Or which point is the point that has to be attacked if I want to bring a raya or a stira? Or how is that hekesh, how is that logic? The clearer you have this part, the more grounded you'll be for that part. So I know it sounds like, because it's so basic, but if you can learn it, and it's not only true in the Gemaras, it's true for any chazal. You can learn to break this down. My examples here, by the way, are for pretty much from the beginning of Mesilla Sisharim. If you can learn to break it, you can take any chazal, whether it's going to be in the Medrash or the Gemara, or a Pasuk, or anything, and you will be strong, you can fight with people, and you'll know you're right. Ultimately, one of the, the big payoffs of this whole thing is 
if you understand the Ramchal, you get the systems, and they're not that hard, if you just stick with it, you will gain tremendous power in learning, and with that comes confidence. The system that Rabbi Mirhoff and I grew up on was a system of a, a derivative of the Chafetz Chaim system in New York, which was a lot of fighting and learning. Rit Chodoraisa. Back and forth, and, like that. and there's a certain place where, even though that's happening to maybe lesser degrees these days, but you still have to use something. You hold something's right, and you want to push for it. But you either can't, you don't got it right, you can't express it right, you're not sure of the picture. I know myself, personal, it built me up in learning. It made me so much stronger. So much stronger, and, that, and we can, what the, the goal really here is, for that which took us years is to give it to over you over in weeks. That's basically it. But you can become strong and confident. It's a tremendous thing for a person to have confidence in learning. That they can go to the, to the Ram and things like that and be able to, or the Chaverim, and nail it and say, listen, I'm right and I show it to you. And I can prove it to you. Look at the Ram Chal. Say, how do you do with the that Chiluk? That's, in the, that, that's really what we're aiming for. To build ourselves up in learning. Not guy that's stronger. Okay. The first example was Nashim Chayv B'Kidosh Hayom. Another example. Yushlaim Eino Metama B'Nagoyim. Jerusalem does not become Tommy with skin blemishes. The predicate to become Tommy with skin blemishes is denied in the subject of Yushalayim. Does everybody see that? Right? Right? The Nasu will always be, you pick out something can be affirmed or denied. Yushalayim could have become Metame, could not become Tame. Ah, that's the Nasu. And where are you affirming that? In Yushalayim. More examples. This is Mesila Shisharim. Ein hatoeles, hanilka mize hasefer, yotzim and akriya bo pam echas. The gain, I think this was the right word, garnered from this book is not derived from a one time reading. Who wants to tell me either what's the predicate or what's the subject? Either what's being spoken about, the subject we speak about what's being spoken about, and the predicate, what are we saying about that thing? We said, Nashim were being spoken about, we said they were Chayev. Yushalayim was the subject, we were saying about it that it was not Metomeh bin Nagoyim. Who wants to try to take a crack at it? Come on guys. Who wants to take a crack at What would you say is the subject of that sense? The gain garnered from this book is not derived from one, a one-time reading. What? The Toelis. Okay. In English, the gain garnered from this book is the subject. Ha Toelis ha nikla mize ha sefer. And the predicate is going to be but in the denied, we're going to say, not so. There will be no gain from it from the, a one-time reading. If you don't see it... Oh, do we have more? If you don't see it, or you're not sure, speak up. Because these are the simple ones. I want you to get the simple ones. Because we're going, we're going to go deeper. No, forget that. You, you, uh, meaning, Reb David, you just went to the an abstraction from it. You just went to like you heard what Reb David said. Ah, that means you need Chazara. That may be true. Maybe it means you need Chazara. Maybe it just means you have to. Uh, I don't. I don't know. But that's not. I first. What was? What is being said? Not already what is the abstraction or the principle we're going to learn from it. We're not going there yet. First, we've got to get what is written. Look at the next one. Hatoelis yatsam in a chazara lava hasmada. The gain comes from reviewing consistency. What's the subject? Again, Again the same thing. Hatoelis and iklat mizah sefer, really from the first one. These two, by the way, are the two parts of the same sentence. I broke them up. And we are going to makayim, we are going to affirm that it comes from chazar v'hasmada. That the to'eles, the, um, the to'eles, ha'to'eles n'kansa sefer is a subject, it's yatsa mina chazar v'hasmada. comes from 
the Chazara and Hasmada, the consistency in the reviewing. Good? Turn the page. That was just the general, get a general feel, nos and nasu. Now we go to the next step. Every subject can be one, can only be, all sentences have to have a subject. They have to have something they're talking about. And you have three types of subjects. That's it. But it's important to know. It's very important to know, was the subject a generality, a specific, or what's called a partial, a mixasi? subject. The whole structure of, what should we say here? It's going to stay, uh, 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 well, a lot of thinking, whether it's Aristotelian or the, the, the Gemaras, whatever it is. Is that a Kalal? Because usually we speak in Kalali. That's a Kalal, that Mishnah, that Brisa. And I have a case that's a Prat. It's a specific. That's a general, that's a specific. How do those two relate? This is a specific of that, a general. Can I learn it out? You must always be very aware of the sentences, especially in your proofs, your steers and your rayas. Is it speaking generally, specifically, or partially? Many of our terutsim will be when we said, nashim chayev bekidu shayom, let's say. Women, women are chayev. You'll say, yeah, but how about, she's a woman, she's not chayev. So, not in that case, but maybe we'll come out where well, the terrorists will be. Now, when I said women, I didn't mean all women. I meant most, majority, probability. That is a very much a transitionary period, uh, transition between us. To know when we are talking about something, we were talking about all the specifics in the general, one specific, some of them. So now... This is really a breakdown that we, we want to look at for a second. General subjects, kololim, that's going to be the name for it. Subjects which include many specifics in the group. Our example, women are obligated in the Kiddush Hayom. That was a no se kolel, women. Many, many. Two, specific subjects, pratim, a prat, where one specific is being spoken about in the sense, Jerusalem does not become tamami with blemishes. Yushalayim is a yachid. I talk about Am Ravinu, Moshe Rabbeinu. If I want to learn something from Moshe Rabbeinu, he, Moshe Rabbeinu, did X, whatever it is. So I can't learn it because of a klal, because that's Moshe Rabbeinu. Meaning, I'll have to go in through intermediary steps of abstracting what Moshe Rabbeinu did, build a general principle from it, and then apply it to me. If I'm going that way. Or... I have another possibility. I can say, listen, I'm Dome. I make a dimyon between me and Moshe Rabbeinu. Everybody learned, knew the Ramchal. No, that was a joke. Um, but it has to, because he's a specific subject. So how do you get from one specific to another specific? There's different, those are the Hekation, which we'll learn. That's when you want to apply rules or principles. But that's a specific, Yushalayim. Partial subjects, number three, Mixasim, where... It's spoken about some of the group. There are women who are permitted to their husbands. Yesh mutaros lebalayim. It's a mission, I believe, in Yevamos. So that's something we want to be aware of. Every, every sentence that we're going to say, I'm going to stop you and say, hey, as we're practicing, I'll say, listen, that subject, what kind was it? You only got three possibilities. Was it talking, it was a klal? Was it a prat? Or was it a mixas? Part of this process is beginning to introduce you to these questions and these gradations are be supposed to be getting to get the heads rolling and say, hmm, okay, I guess I have to look for that now and for you to begin to look at it. More examples. Number one, the intermediary steps that are necessary for one to reach his goal are the mitzvahs. Mishil Shishar. Hayim soim ha-megim adam l'tachlis hazeh, which is there he happens to be talking about getting close to Hashem. Heim ha mitzvahs. Okay? So, first of all, who wants to try for subject and predicate? And then who's going to tell me what kind of subject it is? No. The mitzvahs are not the subject. The mitzvahs are not the subject. Ha em We'll do it in English. Because I don't know people's levels of Hebrew, so let's do it in English. By the way, the translations are mine, so if you want to argue with them, you can. The intermediary steps, the emsoim, 
that are necessary for one to reach his goals are the mitzvahs. The subject, I think, is the intermediary steps that are necessary for one to reach his goal. We are saying they are, yes, the mitzvahs. We could have been saying they're not the mitzvahs. Now, actually, in a sentence like this, you could say to me, well, how do you know? You could reverse it. Maybe we'll reverse it. Okay. Question. I, I'm not arguing. Let me sound you out on that. Why would you go that way? Because the mitzvah says more passion, huh? Okay. Good. Um, what? I would answer like that. Please remind me of your name. Okay. Um, I agree with that. I agree usually in this specific sense it really could go both ways. But that's really where you use context. And the context here happens to be we're talking about the Emsoim to get to Shlemus Adam or Karvil Hashem. Um, it is definitely not always the case. Again, these are rules. How we arrive, arrive, uh, uh, move the rules to the specifics is going to change things. We like it to be. We don't always get what we like, but we like it to be that the subjects come up front. Like, I'm so, and like in this case, the M them are the mitzvahs. You can tell me, no, it's really talking about the mitzvahs. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, well, it surely will make a difference in the shock of Atariya. If you're in a Gemara or any type of dialogue, people don't usually speak out the whole sentence. Like if a guy, Rabbi Minnehoff is trying to convince me something, I go like this. Or our children do that, or our brothers, sisters, or we do it ourselves. You know, just. So one thing of the human mind is that we're going to translate that actually into a statement, which is a whole interesting conversation we can get into on Friday if you want to how Hashem built us, that we take actions and things and put them into statements. But um, that only works in the context of you said something to me, or let's say I said something, you had a kasha and I went like this, or whatever it was. So once you get in the shock of Atariya, you very much have to keep clear what's going to be the subject, what are we talking about, and what are we saying about it. Because if you, it, those parts start getting confused, as the role of the Gemara goes, most of us, many of us, forget most, many of us, we get lost. We get lost in like, well, what was the kasha? What was the teretz? You'll hear many people say, the Gemara asks. So I try to correct people, Lefiani's daiti, and say, listen, that, there is no concept like that, the Gemara asks. Meaning like it's a floating question. Where was the kasha? What's the kasha going on? A kasha, by definition, must be on something. No, no, the Gemara asks openly, generally. It's not true. It doesn't exist. Where, where was that kasha on? So what's why people talking like that? Because we don't have a clear picture of what's of that role of the subject and predicate and things. That's why we're doing this. Okay, next. Okay, I forgot to write. Yeshitirchu ma'od be'mekar habriya v'ateva. There are those, I forgot to write the translation, there are those who, are very, who worked hard in the investigation of health issues and natural sciences. I don't know if that's the exact translation. I made it up on the spot. Okay? So here, by the way, we want to see yesh shetirchu. Remember, on this page, we wanted to look at three, the three different types of subjects. Kolim, prati, miksati. So our statement number one was about, was a kolel. Number one, the intermediary steps that are necessary for one to reach his goal, or the mitzvos. Either way, that subject was a kolel. It was a generalized subject. Number two, the place for performing the mitzvos is this world. Oh, I forgot that one. The place, that's a prati. That's a subject specific, the place. It's not a general, the place. And the third one, Yesha Tirchel, there are those. That is a miksasi, a partial subject. Not everybody, not one, some. There are those who get involved in investigations. So there you have examples of the breakdown of subjects and three examples. Turn the page. Oh. 
That was just the warm-up, folks. Here the fun begins. That breakdown of sentences, all sentences, anywhere in the world that will ever be expressed, will only have, in terms of the subject, only have three possibilities. It's either a kolel, a prat, or a mixas. Good? Now when we get from the size of the predicates, we have two breakdowns. We have simple sentences and complex sentences. Now we already said about that the every predicate can be affirmed or denied. Now we're going to a new bechina, a new aspect of, of the predicate. That which we want to say about the subject. They can be simple sentences or complex sentences. What is a simple sentence? I talked to you before about complexities. And when the mind begins to have nuance or fragmentation, there's a lot of issues and you have to make like some picture out of it. Too many pixels coming in and your mind has to like make images out of it. Well, that's what happens conceptually. So the first column, simple sentences, are going to go, are basically involved with the first sentence is going to be unencumbered, an undefined sentence, which means no limitations, no conditions, straight. Like we said, women are chayev in Kiddush. I didn't, there was no qualifications about it. It was open. All the other four simple sentences are going to be involved with that. Limitations and qualifications. We go basically from an open to constricted. All the simple sentences. And we're talking conceptually also, because remember, how we talk is just a way to express ourselves. You have a thing that's unencumbered, and you go to these different types of constrictions. You can put a condition on it, and, we'll, and, we'll, and with that, I'm going to show you the four right now. But they're all in that. The first one, an undefined. Five simple sentences, single subjects, and single predicates. Number one, undefined. It's called a Stom statement, where the predicate is said without conditional limitation. And he gives an example. Let's just do the English first before we get involved in the, uh, the specifics. Number two, a special, a muhat statement, where the predicate is said in a special way and limitation, i.e., definitely, he definitely did, vadai, he must be, muhrach, possibility, efshar, doubt, suffolk, impossibility, not shayach, low efshar. Those are all limitations how if I said to you, Nashim uh, Chayiv Bekidah Shayom. Women are an unencumbered statement, an undefined statement, open, open. If I then said women vaday Chayiv Bekidah Shayom, that makes a different statement. How do we know? If you give Adas, and the guy says, eh, but he says he vaday whatever. The, that in like there are certain places that that makes a big difference, and we'll see in the Gemara. Gemara will start a sentence Pshita. Ba 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 ba. So the fact that it says this case was pshita, this case lema, maybe. So here started. They made a distinction between that which was pshita, maybe like a vadai, maybe not. It's a good discussion, and something that was a suffix. Big differences. So that's that first one of a limitation. The second one it's actually called limitation. A memayet. Either the subject or the predicate are limited to this one only. You'll see the example. Iker mitzvah sa'adam ba'olam hazeh hu rak l'kayim ha-mitzvahs. Oh, mitzvah, sorry. Iker mitzvah sa'adam ba'olam hazeh hu rak l'kayim ha-mitzvahs. It's a different thing when the Ramchal came to us and told us in the Mesilah Shisharim, the essential uh, mitzvah's existence of man in this world is only l'kayim mitzvahs. You don't have to put that word only in there. I could tell you it's essential it is to the Kai Mitzvahs. Maybe you could do some other things on the side, I don't like that. If I tell it's only, that's a different thing, but again, a limitation. I'm saying this one and not the others. Four, excluding. Where one of the group is excluded from the group concerning this specific Nasu. All except this are is like a classic language. Hakol Shachatin Chutz, Mecher Shadavakatan. Again, it's a limitation. I'm telling you, a cherishot and a katan are definitely part of hakol. Everybody's going for ice cream except that guy. All third graders. All the third graders are going for ice cream except Ruvain. 
Well, Ruven is a third grader. Yes, but for this predicate, this Nasu of getting ice cream, it's like he's not. I know he is. I didn't kick him out of the third grade. It just happens to be he's not going to get ice cream. That's called a chut statement, as we all know. Again, a limitation on the nasu. This predication of getting ice cream is limited. It's not given to everybody, everybody except Reuven. Last one, a conditional statement, where the predicate is set on condition or partially in one aspect. The language you normally see is in terms of, he is a great guy, if we're talking about Shidduch. He is a great guy uh, when it comes to Hasmat. Uh, how's he in Midos? Uh, I'm not talking to you about that. Um, how's he about in terms of Davin? I'm not talking to you about that. I say, he's a great guy in this one Bechina. That's called a conditional statement, a Mugbal statement. The example here is, uh, I have other better examples. We'll get to the better examples in a second. But where we say in th either in terms of or on condition, I'm definitely going to the beach tomorrow on the condition that it doesn't snow. Halabai. Or in this aspect. So those are all conditional statements. But you see the point being that these simple statements, we went from number one, which was very open, unencumbered, undefined, and then we, each of them had certain types of limitations, constrictions. Okay? But, and I tried to give you here the relative words that we normally use. It doesn't mean, and don't be mistaken to mean, that if it doesn't have the classic words, it can't be that. A person could ex be telling you, he's the only, you know, only this. He doesn't ever say the word only. But you have to try to understand what they're saying. As we'll talk about at the beginning of next week, all of this, which is a very strong principle here, is what are you aiming for when you either read something, whether it's a Gemara or Lashon Chazal or a newspaper article or hear somebody speak? What you're aiming for is what did that person want to tell you? What was their kavana in the words that they said? It's a skill. It's a nuance. It's also sometimes an intuition. We are giving it to you here. The Ramchal gave it to us in what's called a direct or a straight form, you're going to want to say what that person tells you. It could be your wife. I used to teach chassanim. I used to joke around. What I really need to teach chassanim is this skill so when their wives talk to them, they'll be able to understand their wives properly. <laughs> because many times people, they, one of my favorite examples, the mommy says to the kid who's going out the door, are you going outside without your galoshes in the rain, you know, without your snow boots or whatever, you're without your parker or whatever? If the kid turns around and says, yes, to his mother, or many other examples like that, he, never, he didn't understand what she wanted. She wasn't asking him. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. Do not go outside without your uh, whatever. In the rain. What we're looking for is not necessarily the words, or the words are the way we give what we mean but we, we're, we're looking behind the words. We want to know what is the intention, the word that the Ram Chal uses is kavana. What is the person's kavana when he said that to you? And then we have to take that kavana and put it into one of these forms to get a clear, exact read. The person, we don't always talk like that. We don't always put the subject in the beginning. We, as you saw some case in the Ram Chal, he himself puts an ain, ain, well, I forgot which one that is, he puts the no in the beginning and like that. But that's not what you want. What did he say? When we're going to come to the shock of Ataria, like many places in life, this is an essential tool where we have, you're going to read the Gemara and you're going to say, what was this, the Makshan, the Matatsan, what was he saying? Very, very much there comes the element in the fact that it's a dialogue. There's two people talking to each other as we've said numerous times already in this conversation, and that was the essential thing that we began, that the Gemara itself is a masa matana yuni. It is a dialogue, so it comes in that context, but it still has to come down to this. What did he say? Put it in straight language for me. Then I can manipulate it. Then I can work with it. I have to put it into my form. But we're going for kavana. One second, what time are we here?
Two more minutes? A more? I don't know. Uh, people have to rush, leave, what? Hello? Okay, let's go on. Complex statements. That was the first part. That was simple statements. Here come the complex statements. Complex statements are the multiple subjects and or predicates. The first one is a hypothetical statement. The reason the English is very important is because it very much has the meaning of what it says. Hypothetical, we understand, means a, something that does not have to be real. If the moon is made of cheese, I'm sure there's mice up there who are going to eat from it. This is a very powerful statement because in its freedom of being able to be hypothetical, we can use it very creatively to prove things. And it's used all the time in the Gemara. As, as in life. Why is it complex? It's complex because you're going to see here you have two uh, sections and you can even have um, multiples because you can, you can relate two subjects, a subject and a predicate, this subject and predicate to this subject and predicate. We're not only more talking about one subject and one predicate or even necessarily one subject and two predicates or two, pro two subjects and one predicate. We're going to be talking about if, if, um, I don't know. If Aryeh Derry comes back into uh, forms a political party, then uh, many people will vote for him. So it's a subject and a predicate. If Aryeh Derry comes, what? And then, then what? So it's no longer a simple subject, simple predicate, one predicate, subject, one predicate. If it rains, the streets will be wet. Hypothetical statement. The beginning of a, hypo a hypothetical statement is the beginning of a hypothetical syllogism, which means we add another step and come with a conclusion. Who can tell me, by the way, what are the two toladas, the two outgrowths that can come out of a hypo that hypothetical statement? In terms, if we want to prove something, if we want to get a, a totsa, a new idea out of it. If it rains, the streets will be wet. No. That's not logical. Don't take it. I, I make that mistake myself all the time. But no, that's not true. It says if it rains, the streets will be wet. There's only two things we can say about it. If the streets, uh, if, the, if it does rain, the streets will be wet. And if the streets are not wet, it didn't rain. Right? If you do, because what is this statement saying to us? It's telling us one thing, a relationship before, well, the kodem, what's technically called the antecedent, the beginning, where the condition is, if it rains, with the nimshach, with the conclusion. So that's really what it's telling us. If it rains, the streets will be wet. That's, it's not telling us that it will rain. It's not telling us the streets are wet. It's just telling us if it rains, the streets will be wet. So therefore, I now could supply. Oh, it rained. Oh, now I know the streets are wet. That's number one. Number two is the streets are not wet. Oh, must be it didn't rain. This is a classic form we'll learn more about. Very powerful, used every daf of Gemara and in conjunction with other things. For that alone, it's worth it to come to, to stick out the time to learn how to the, the hecation. Next page. If a man takes charge of himself, then Hashem will help him and he will be saved. From Asila Shisharim. Okay? That was a... We're going to move a little bit quicker because I need to show of hands here. Who has to leave? Okay, good. So let's stop here. Thank you.